guess you can see we can start now. Okay, so today we're very happy to have Adam Tirumalai, uh, who's coming from a much warmer part of the continent, <laughs> Arizona State University, where he's a postdoctoral fellow. Adam received his uh, PhD in 2012 from the University of British Columbia under the supervision of Jeremy Hyatt. And uh, uh, I guess over these, uh, over the graduate period and uh, later on, his research has focused on, focused on two components, quite disparate but equally interesting. One is, uh, of course, dealing with the atomic structure in high magnetic fields. And the other one is uh, the stellar winds coming off of ADB stars with dust contamination. It's another separate uh, topic for another talk. So it's a split personality. <laughs> <laughs> but today, uh, he's going to tell us something about the atomic structure. Thank you. Thank you, Ramandir. Very, it's very nice to be in, here in Toronto. I've never experienced anything lower than minus 12 degrees C. So this is a very nice experience for me. And thank you for having me out here. <laughs> um, so I shall be talking about work that I've been doing for the past few years on atomic structure of, uh, of atoms, low uh, Z atoms, and sort of tending into mid Z atoms and really strong magnetic fields, fields that are pertinent to uh, magnetized white dwarfs and neutron stars. So. Um, I'm going to structure the talk in a very simple sort of fashion. I'll talk a little bit about um, spectra and um, what we sort of need for their analysis and point out some serious gaps in our understanding. Um, then I'll talk about high B field physics related to atomic structure. I'll talk a little bit about what we're able to do t in a terrestrial context with regard to high magnetic fields. And of course, about astrophysical laboratories, compact objects, and so on. And then I'll get into the, the crux of the talk about what happens to atoms as we subject them to these really strong magnetic fields. And then I'll talk a little bit about different approaches and convey the state of the art in this field. And uh, then I'll talk about my own stuff, which is um, lately I've been working on uh, pseudospectral methods as applied to um, you know, atomic structure, how to solve these, uh, uh, these problems using pseudospectral methods. And then talk a little bit about what's ahead in this field. So as we all know, um, magnetized white dwarfs exist, and many times their field strengths are quite high. This, for example, is a Zeeman tomograph, uh, tomography that was done by Bjornman et al. And um, they looked at EF Eridani, and they found that the average field is about 80 megagauss, which is fairly strong, uh, even for a magnetized white dwarf. Um, and they also found that in some places, the field exists. It extends quite far out almost about 10 stellar radii from the surface of the, of the magnetized white dwarf. So it's, it's a, a quite a dynamic and um, very important part of the, of the physics of the star. And so we know, you know that many of these uh, white dwarfs have these magnetic fields. What is here? Um, that's as far out as they were able to detect the magnetic field in terms of the stellar radii. How do you detect magnetic fields outside the solar surface? Um, I think they must have got some, some lines or something that they were able to see and then correlated it with some other sort of measurements. So this is Zeeman tomography, so they're looking at lines, but maybe the strength of the magnetic Yeah, something like that. But I don't know how they were able to. But I don't know what the limits are on how they were able to get this to what precision, but uh, I guess they were trying to ask the question, how far away were they able to see the emission somehow? We can, we, we can look it up, I can, yeah. Um, and of course, neutron stars, just about all of them are magnetized and strongly magnetized, even the recycled millisecond pulsars are, you know, they have 10 to the 11 gauss or more. So practically all of the compact objects, namely white, magnetized white dwarfs and compact and uh, neutron stars are strongly magnetized. So just to sort of give a, a comparison, um, white dwarfs, they're often found in planetary nebulae and um, pulsars are often found in supernova remnants. Um, the run of the mill white dwarfs typically have fields which are around or less than 10 to the 4 gauss. The magnetized varieties can extend, um, can have really high fields up to you know, a gigagauss or so. 
Um, but this is only a small percentage of the population, namely between 10 to the 4 Gauss and 10 to the 9 Gauss. It's about 10% of the white dwarf population, which is in that range. Um, on the other hand, um, it's a small percentage of neutron stars, which are strongly magnetized. Um, and I don't know what percentage that is, but it is, it is small. It's like a handful of objects, I think. Um, the fields, in the case of uh, white dwarfs, are thought to be generated by fossil fields and possibly from mergers of uh, two white dwarfs, particularly for the magnetized variety. And there's also s some question of whether there's some sort of internal dynamo that's acting, but um, I don't think people know. Um, again, in, in a similar sort of scenario exists for neutron stars where you could have an internal dynamo and people here are more than experts uh, in this field. Um, those are just some of the similarities between these two types of objects. Um, if we look at spectra of magnetized wh of white dwarfs, mostly we see that they come in two varieties. Um, they are the DA or the DB varieties, namely either they have hydrogen lines or helium lines. Um, elements which are typically heavier than hydrogen or helium would probably settle in the atmospheres because the settling time scales would be on the order of about 100 years or so. Um, so however, we do see some DQ white dwarfs, which show carbon lines. And uh, presumably, uh, these are younger white dwarfs because we, f uh, we see that they're hotter. Um, although um, there's a recent study that came out in uh, last year, which says that because if some of these DQ white dwarfs, if they have large magnetic fields, then the magnetic fields on the surface may um, inhibit cooling. And as a result, we may be underestimating their ages, meaning that they could actually be older than what they are. Um, so for the DQ white dwarfs, the carbon that we see in the, on the surface, it could have come from a variety of uh, ways. It could have come from either just a regular massive AGB star, which lost its uh, helium envelope, or perhaps the, the AGB uh, star was much more massive and it had an oxygen, neon, magnesium core, and the outer layer was mostly carbon. So it could be that, um, or it could be that um, it could be a completely different scenario. Um, when we look at um, white dwarfs and what sort of elements we see in the spectra, we see that about a quarter of all white dwarfs have elements which are heavier, uh, like you know, heavier than carbon, in their uh, in their spectra, and and we find that regardless of the temperature, which is a good indicator of how old they are we see that about approximately a quarter of them have these elements. So the question is, uh, why do they exist regardless of the age of the, of, the, of the white dwarf? Particularly if the white dwarf is older, then we would expect that the heavier elements would settle down. So the question is, why do we see them there? So one possible explanation is that perhaps they're accreting ambient material from the debris disk, and that is perhaps depositing carbon onto the atmospheres of these white dwarfs, and so it is an emerging route for speculating about exoplanet bulk compositions. So yeah, so we see um, a lot of heavy elements, well, heavier than carbon, so to speak. Um, if we look at neutron stars, um, the story is a little different. The spectra are, if you want to, f if you want to f uh, play around and fit it, one would typically use um, some sort of black body plus other emissions, which add on to it and you try and model the spectra. Um, and however, for neutron stars, we don't have the, uh, the spectra resolved to, this, to the extent that we have for white dwarfs, so it's not possible to see lines and so on at present. Um, however, there, are, there is one example, for example, um, Cas A, which is a peculiar neutron star. It actually has um, carbon in its atmosphere where uh, this is a study by Ho and Hinke, which was done in 2009. This is a, a neutron star with a, a low magnetic field, about 10 to the 11 Gauss, and it has um, carbon, which they've been able to um, find by spectral analysis um, on the, in, in, the, um, in the emergent spectra that they get from the neutron star. So the question is, um, how did it get there? And one possible um, scenario is that the neutron star is possibly accreting matter onto it. And uh, there are, this is not the only one. There could be uh, something that happened during supernova fallback, perhaps. Um, but one likely scenario is that it was accreting ambient material, and therefore carbon is now visible in the atmosphere of the, um, of the neutron star.
If we look at terrestrial magnetic fields, on the other hand, um, in the lab, we can generate uh, supermagnets consistently of strengths of about 10 tesla or so. So that's about 10 to the 5 gauss. Um, recent experiments with graphene, they've been able to um, arrange the lattice in almost uh, Landau-like levels. So the atoms behave as though they're experiencing really high magnetic fields. But it's, it's not really. There is no real magnetic field there. But they behave as though they're experiencing a magnetic field of about 3 megagauss. So that's the strongest sort of Landau-like behavior that they've been able to generate in the, uh, in the laboratory context. On the other hand, in heavy ion colliders, it's possible to generate um, fields of about 10 to the 18 gauss or so, but these are really transient. They are sub-attosecond timescales. So one can't really do experiments um, with any of these things, uh, particularly if one wants to study atomic structure in these really strong magnetic fields. Um, so what really happens to, to atoms when you put them into strong magnetic fields? Um, it's, it's also a question of uh, where on this diagram one would like to examine um, the particular field strength. So for example, if one is at the low end, which is anything terrestrial, this would be up to about 10 tesla or so, or you know, less than on this scale which is in units of 10 to the 9 gauss, it would be less than you know, 10 to the minus 2 or so. Um, this number is important because at around 10 to the 9 gauss, in an atom, the interaction of the electrons with the, the magnetic field is of the same order of magnitude as the interaction with the, with the nucleus. So it's a, it's a good parameter for um, measuring the strength of the interaction of the, of the electrons with the field. Um, so. As an astrophysicist, I would consider anything which is below um, beta of about 1 to be either low or sub-intense, or let's say strong. And all the magnetized white dwarfs are in this, in this domain, uh, whereas the neutron stars are, are much higher field strengths. And um, all the things that we know from our regular quantum mechanics, like perturbation theory and passion back effect and so on, it all applies in these low fields. Um, however, for some of the magnetized white dwarfs and almost all of the neutron stars, they lie squarely in the intermediate field regime. And I'll talk a little bit more about what these distinctions are. And then as we get to higher and higher field strengths, we enter what's called the Landau regime. So if we are in uh, the low end um, sort of strong field strengths, um, and if we subject an atom to a magnetic field of these uh, magnitudes, then if we want to analyze what's going on, we could write down a Hamiltonian, which consists of the interaction of the electron with the nucleus, and another part which consists of the electron with the, with the field. And this is just a small perturbation to this. So in, in these magnetic field strengths, uh, we have a, a basis for expanding the wave functions, which we're all familiar with. We have the spherical harmonics, and then we have the uh, radial functions. So it's easy to construct a perturbation theory or to do any other sort of Hartree-Fox type of analysis. Whereas when we go to this really intense field, namely into the Landau regime, then we have a reverse scenario where the Hamiltonian consists of um, <coughs> an interaction with the field plus the nucleus. However, in this case, the interaction of the electrons with the nucleus becomes a small perturbation to the interaction uh, with the field itself. So in, this, in these field strengths, one can construct a basis for expanding the wave function using Landau levels and an, and an axial um, part of the wave function, which tells you how the electrons move along the magnetic axis. However, um, unfortunately, you know, in the intermediate field regime, which is namely just about all the neutron stars and um, the magnetized white dwarfs, here in this regime, both the interaction of the electron with the nucleus and the field are of equal magnitude or similar magnitudes. So there is, as a result, there is no basis for expanding the wave function. The only good quantum number that comes out is the azimuthal quantum number, and we're left with trying to find out this, um, the wave function. Of the, of the electrons in the atom by just through numerical means. <laughs>
So to give you an example of uh, what happens, this is, um, I've shown here um, how the energy, the ground state energy of hydrogen, how it evolves as we turn on the, um, the magnetic field. Um, the dashed line here is just perturbation theory, and it rapidly breaks down in these field strengths, which is about, so 10 to the 0, 1, this is about 10 to the 9 Gauss. This is about 10 to the 8 Gauss. So it starts to break down in this regime, which is these field strengths are relevant to the highest end of magnetized white dwarfs, and perhaps, possibly, and definitely not neutron stars. I don't know if there's any neutron stars in these field strengths, but definitely the higher end of magnetic, magnetized white dwarfs, perturbation theory for sure breaks down. So if you want to get at the energy levels, or if you want to get at any of the transition data, you, you probably can't do perturbation theory to get, the, get those data you have to do a full-on numerical treatment. And um, there's also an added complication in, in how um, the electrons are actually arranged in the energy levels, the chemistry, so to speak. So in the, in the low field strength, we're, uh, I've shown here an example of carbon, which exists in a form that we're familiar with. We have these closed shells. And then in the, in, in the 2p level, we've got uh, electrons that, that are uh, partially filled. 2p orbital. But when we turn on fields which are uh, much below 10 to the 9 Gauss, we know from our quantum mechanics that you know the degeneracy of these p orbitals is lifted. However, um, as these energy levels split, we still maintain a partially spin polarized configuration, namely that some of the electrons are aligned with the field, whereas the others are aligned anti to the field. So there, it remains in a partially spin polarized configuration. And, the, and it's important that, the, um, that there are closed shells. So only these come into play when we talk about chemistry of the, of the atom. However, when we go into the intense field regime, the chemistry is totally different. What happens is that it's energetically favorable for the electrons to all anti-align with the field. And so when you anti-align, when all of them are anti-aligned, they have to then reside in different orbitals. And it, and it turns out that for carbon, in, sort of, in these sort of intense field strengths, after the electrons have become fully spin polarized, the ground state configuration is completely different. Um, again, this, this spectroscopic notation is only valid if there wasn't a field strength. So if you want to uh, write out what the atom is, the configuration of the atom, um, you can't really use the spectroscopic notation. Uh, it's a different sort of notation that one has to use to, to uh, distinguish various atomic states or configurations, and I'll get to that in a moment. But the key thing here is that we no longer have any more closed shells. So all of these electrons contribute to the chemistry of the atom. The, uh, so at some point, in the intense field regime, an atom which is partially spin polarized at some uh, magnetic field strength, it's energetically favorable for it to become fully spin polarized. And that spin flip trans transition occurs for various atoms um, in, the, um, in, in the intense field regime, which is you know, denoted by this parameter gamma. So um, like for example, carbon, which is here, occurs at around 20 or so. What's gamma? Gamma is 10 to the 9-ish. Gamma of 1 is 10 to the 9-ish Gauss, yeah. OK. So as I mentioned, the chemistry also is quite, quite unique in these field strengths. Um, this is very recent work that was carried out by Helgarker and Lange et al. Um, from the University of Oslo. So we know in a terrestrial context that um, for atoms to bond in, let's say, homonuclear bonding, um, you can form two types of strong bonds. You can form covalent bonds, or you can form ionic bonds. However, a, a new type of bonding mechanism operates at really strong field strengths. Um, this is called perpendicular paramagnetic bonding. Um, so these are, so what I've shown here are two, um, two um, hydrogen nuclei, oh, atoms, not nuclear, atoms, 
And they're in two different configurations. Uh, in the first configuration, the bond between the atoms is parallel to the field. And in the second, the bond is perpendicular to the field. So on these plots, anything that's a solid line corresponds to this configuration, namely the parallel configuration. And anything which is a dashed line corresponds to the perpendicular um, case. So when you bring two hydrogen atoms together, they can um, bond via um, a bonding orbital. Um, and they form a sigma bond, in which case you have two bonding orbitals of each of the hydrogen atoms they bond. And in this case, as you increase the field strength from zero all the way to 2.25 times 10 to the 9-ish Gauss, uh, we see a very strange thing that occurs for the, for the regular way in which hydrogen bonds. What happens is that um, as you increase the field strength, um, let's look at the case of the, of the parallel configuration. We see that the parallel, in, the, in the parallel configuration, uh, it, the bonding becomes more and more shallow. So the bond strength decreases. Additionally, we see a separation between the parallel and the perpendicular uh, configurations. So we find that the parallel configuration, as the magnetic field increases, remains a little bit more bound than the perpendicular case. However, in both cases, the bonding becomes weaker and weaker as we increase the field strength. On the other hand, there is a, a triplet state which consists of a, a bonding and an antibonding orbital. When these bond, typically in a terrestrial context, which is um, you know zero field strength or thereabouts, they're both they can bond. There is a minima to this, to this curve, it's somewhere around here, but um, but the it's more shallow com in comparison to the to the singlet state. So the singlet is more bound than the triplet. So in a terrestrial context, the the triplet would be more favored than the than the singlet case. However, as we turn on the field strength for the for the tri um, for the triplet state, we find that. Uh, as the field strength increases, the, it becomes deeper and deeper, na uh, namely it becomes more and more bound. And in fact, the, um, the behavior is that the perpendicular case in which the bond is oriented perpendicular to the magnetic field is energetically favored in comparison to the one in which it's oriented parallel. So this, this bonding mechanism um, is possible because of a stabilization of the, of the antibonding orbital as you increase the magnetic field strength. So this only occurs in field strengths which are greater than about, or in the vicinity of 10 to the 9 Gauss. So namely, the higher end of magnetized white dwarfs. So, Quick question, yep. in the case of the particular bonding, don't you have the principal continuous spectrum with the fact that you put the two atoms at different positions? Yes. So. The, the minima, yeah. this what you're looking at here is the distance between the, okay. the nuclei. So at some point, this, the energy is, goes through a minimum. And that's the strongest bond. So yes, you do have, you can bond at these greater distances. But the, the bond binding energy is lower. But if it was the parallel bonding, it naturally relaxes to the, the energy across the bottom. That's right. Yeah. So terrestrially speaking, this in the low f uh, in, in a terrestrial context, this is much more shallow than the uh, than the parallel case, than any of the parallel cases. So so here, whether you're in the parallel or the perpendicular case, the the singlet state is always more bound than the triplet state, namely that the antibonding orbital is not stabilized, whereas in this case it is. So this is a very recent result from a couple of years ago. Right. And you're setting that to zero. Um, that so you're like a spin orbit coupling between the. Well. Oh, you mean with as as, as, as yeah. Does it add to the spectrum of the? Well, it will. Yeah. 
You're saying the photons have zero flat. Yeah. So they're the lowermost state. Yeah. Okay, so we know that the chemistry is vastly different in these really high field strengths. The, the atomic configurations are also mostly fully spin polarized. So these effects play into the spectra that we see from, um, from magnetized white dwarfs as well as neutron stars. So a lot of stuff has to go in if we want to accurately interpret the spectra of these compact objects, such as you know we have to know um, transition data. We need data for the bound-bound and bound-free transitions. Uh, we also need, first of all, for the um, um, neutron stars, higher sensitivity spectrometers. Um, we also need uh, atomic structure codes that are capable of generating this data and um, possibly even combined atomic structure codes with spectral analysis codes. Um, my work is uh, focusing on these two, where I try to determine the structure of atoms in field strength, so namely all the, basically as much as I can of the periodic table. And the other focus of my work is to build um, fast atomic structure codes so that if people in the astrophysical community, if they want to integrate these codes at some point into their own sp uh, spectral analysis software, it's not a huge computational overhead for them. Um, there is a huge if. Um, people haven't really looked at the effects of crossed electric and magnetic fields. Um, it's a largely uncharted domain and it totally warps the energy level diagram. Things are... Basically that, I mean, it goes across the equator, across the magnetic field. Yes, yeah. And that has the same sign for all, both signs of charge, so they move together. Exactly, yeah. So that changes the equal Yeah. So it's, it's a big beast. Um, not many people have looked at it. I certainly haven't looked at it yet. But you want to understand the same case first. Yep. <laughs> So, yeah, so I'm focusing for now on these two aspects. There are, there's been a lot of studies that have been done, but strangely, despite you know, more than 60, 70 years of efforts that have been put into this field, uh, data is still quite, quite limited for at atomic structure in strong fields. The first study was actually by Yafet Adams and Keyes, believe it or not, in 1956. It was a, a hydrogen atom in field strengths relevant to, at that time, um, semiconductor devices, so on the order of about 10 to the 9 Gauss. Um, then in the 70s, we found uh, magnetized white dwarfs and neutron star fields were discovered, and a whole bunch of an, an industry got set up. People did a lot of variational studies, uh, namely Surmelian and O'Connor and um, Kunin Langakar, etc. They also contributed around this time. And then in the 80s and the 90s, uh, people did a lot of work, particularly in Germany, on uh, low Z atoms, hydrogen and helium. And these were basically Hartree-Fox studies. And then later in the 90s, um, a group at, uh, in the States, Jones, Kepley, et cetera, they worked with uh, density functional theory, which is very good for uh, getting at the ground levels, ground state energies of, of systems, and also some quantum, quantum Monte Carlo codes. Um, later in the early 90s and 2000s, another group, Schmelker and Ivanov, basically in Germany, they worked on um, low and mid-Z. So low Z would be something like lithium to oxygen or carbon. Mid-Z would be anything from carbon to, say, silicon or phosphorus and so on. They used uh, Hartree-Fock as well as configuration interaction approaches. Uh, and they also studied, uh, studied molecules and chains. And then... What is configuration interaction? Yes. I, I will come to that. Yep. Um, and then uh, in the past few years, uh, again, Scheimerchek, who is actually a student of Wunner in Germany, they've been developing really fast quantum Monte Carlo codes. They, they are able to calculate structure of atoms in a matter of minutes. So these are some of the fastest and most accurate codes available today. Um, configuration interaction is basically um, when you study the Hartree-Fock equation, you write down a configuration for the electrons, and you just use one Slater determinant. So that's just one configuration. So you could use a Slater determinant saying that, as I showed you before, the electrons become partially spin polarized. So they exist in different spectroscopic orbitals. So you say that the atom consists, let's say helium, consists of an electron in the 1s, and say another electron in the 2p. 
So that's one configuration. So your Slater determinant only consists of those two orbitals. So that's just one uh, configuration. However, you could have, a, um, it could be you know, various different configurations, and you could expand your wave function as a linear superposition of all these different configurations. So one configuration could be 1s2p, the others could be 1s3d, and then there could be mixing between configurations. So that's a, a configuration interaction approach where you have, we construct a large basis set of various configurations, and then you assume that the, that the wave, function, wave functions are known ahead of time, and you try and determine the coefficients in the linear expansion. And you optimize those in a variational scheme to try and minimize the energy. But you said you assume the wave function. Yes, yes. You, so you assume, let's say you assume hydrogenic wave functions uh, for the 1s, 2p, etc., and then you only minimize the, the expansion coefficients. Whereas m there's another scheme called the multi-configuration scheme, which is a step ahead of that, where you need, we make no assumptions. We don't even know the wave functions, and you don't even know the coefficients, the mixing coefficients. So that's, a, um, that's an even tougher problem to solve. So um, it's a bit more computationally demanding as well. So once we get at atomic structure, we can do a whole bunch of things with um, the spectra of uh, magnetized white dwarfs. So this is um, a, a magnetized white dwarf called EUVJ0317-85.5. It has a magnetic field between about two to eight million Gauss. And uh, this is a study by Venice et al. And they were able to analyze its spectra. Uh, here we see um, Lyman alpha, beta, et cetera, and how the transition wavelengths, how they vary as a function of the magnetic field strength. And so they're able to analyze the emergent spectra and make a reasonable guess about what sort of lines, what sort of absorption features correspond to which transitions. So this sort of data is what one needs if one needs to calculate, if one needs to interpret the spectra that we see. Um, for neutron stars, we need a bit more sensitivity. We're not there yet. So one, once we do uh, get data, we can, get, uh, we can generate data for a lot of uh, states. So this is. Uh, again, the group by Schmelke in Germany, this is in 2001. This is atomic data for uh, helium in really strong fields, transition data as a function of uh, magnetic field strengths for one of the excited states. So all sorts of uh, strange behavior occurs where the transition wavelengths, they undergo minima and then they rise up and so on. So it's, it varies greatly in the strong field regime. And it's quite, uh, the, the behavior here, here is, um, is quite dense, and the lines are all quite compact and quite together. So sometimes you get these various level crossings that you have to carefully check to make sure you're following the right uh, transition wavelength and so on. So it's a, it's a fairly numerically complex um, problem to solve. Um, this is, again, work by Schmelke, where you see um, the ground state of the carbon atom, which is, I believe it is, this one. So here, they, they simulated from various uh, field strengths. And they, what, what you see is that as, so in, the, in this plot, going from the top to the bottom, the field strength is increasing for the various states shown here. Um, this is the, the S wave, where you see it just shrinks. And um, this, for example, is a, is a P wave, where it, the, the, uh, the atom just completely shrinks and becomes more bound. And this happens because um, the magnetic field introduces a fundamental anisotropy, and the motion of the electrons, because of the field, is restricted in the perpendicular direction. So when you do that, they sample the space around the nucleus a lot more, and so they fall into the potential. And when they do that, they just become more bound. So that's what you uh, see here happening. So um, how much of the periodic table do we actually know in uh, really strong magnetic fields? Well, we know hydrogen and helium fairly well. We know most of, its, most of their energy levels, and we know uh, lots of the transition wavelengths for a variety of the different uh, 
uh, states. Well, so how yep. accurately are the energy levels of helium We know up to about fourth or fifth decimal place. Which is enough, given there are enough uncertainties in the, from the astrophysics. Um, for elements heavier than that, we only know a handful of states. Um, for beryllium and boron, we know about maybe six or seven states. Same thing for lithium, although these are probably not as astrophysically important as, say, carbon or oxygen. Um, for these, the data is even less. I mean, we, we know maybe four or five. And when it comes to the rest of the periodic table, namely the heavier elements, um, only the ground state energies are known, um, particularly say, things like silicon, phosphorus, and sulfur, which we do see in magnetized white dwarfs. So it's hard to analyze the spectra really well unless we know uh, more data for these, uh, for these um, atoms. So what I do, I, I, I do atomic structure with... Um, basically at the Hartree-Fock level, uh, because if we want to improve the data for, say, things like silicon or sulfur and so on, we first need um, the Hartree-Fock level done really well, and then we can go to post-Hartree-Fock um, levels of accuracy. But even at the Hartree-Fock level, with just one configuration, we're able to get about uh, fourth decimal place accuracy uh, with uh, what I'm going to talk about, um, whereas, um, other, other methods, they tend to not give you that level of accuracy. And then you have to, to get around fourth or fifth decimal place accuracy with other methods, like you know, a, a finite difference approach or um, a quantum Monte Carlo approach. One has to uh, then introduce lots more configurations to attain that level of accuracy. And this has, and um, so I do the Hartree-Fock, uh, solve the Hartree-Fock equations using pseudo-spectral methods. And the key, there are a few uh, advantages. Namely, we get spectral accuracy for a certain class of problems, particularly smooth problems. And uh, eigenvalue problems, which are elliptic, are, for the most part, they are smooth. Uh, computational times are greatly reduced um, to a matter of mere seconds, which could be important if we're trying to couple atmos um, atmosphere codes with atomic structure codes. Um, the accuracy is equal to or better than other methods. And the codes themselves are com compact, and it's computationally a very straightforward approach. So I'll just talk very briefly about the method. So let's take, for example, the hydrogen atom and subject it to a really strong field. And we can write out the Hamiltonian in cylindrical coordinates here. Um, cylindrical coordinates is more suitable because the atom gets stretched along the field. So it's easier to. Uh, get more accuracy in cylindrical coordinates as you do the calculations. Um, so there are various terms. The, um, the kinetic term is the first bunch of things. And then you have the, the Zeeman terms, which are proportional to the field in a linear and a quadratic fashion. And then you have the Coulomb interaction of the electron with the field itself. Um, again, as I said, there's no basis for expanding the wave function in the intermediate field. Um, so what we do is just have a wave function which is a combination of um, some real wave function times a, um, an imaginary part, a, a complex part. So, so because we still have a, a good quantum number, namely the azimuthal quantum number. But to do any uh, calculations, we, one needs to discretize it. So namely, you have to get to a, an algebraic set of equations mm -hmm. for the eigenvalue problem. So to do that, um, what we can do is we, we look at, let's say in this example, um, an S wave in cylindrical coordinates of, of hydrogen. There are some symmetries here, namely we still have azimuthal symmetry, and also there is a symmetry with respect to the z equal to zero plane. Namely, anything above it is very similar to what's below it. So exploiting these symmetries, we can then just only focus on a slice and just focus on determining the wave function in this reduced domain. We can then um, use a a, a discretization, uh, discretization approach. Um, with pseudo-spectral methods, I adopted uh, chebyshev lobato uh, points for discretizing the domain. So the first thing one does is one has to compactify the domain, conformally map it to a, to a compact domain. 
uh, once you've done that, you can then locate the uh, Ch uh, Chebyshev Lobato points. Um, the, uh, these, these are, the idea is that the Chebyshev polynomials um, have um, the property that they have zeros along these locations. And um, also, uh, so this, in this case, this would be a Chebyshev um, pseudospectral method of order three. So you have uh, four zeros of the polynomials, and you collocate the discretization points along the zeros of the polynomials. And you use the polynomials to interpolate between the data points. Um, the wave function, which is defined in this domain, has to die off at the infinities, so you can just imp impose Dirichlet conditions at the infinities. However, on the inner boundaries, you could have Neumann or Dirichlet type conditions. So one has to then uh, handle that with a, a little bit of care. Um, so if one were to write out an eigenvalue problem, one could write it um, in matrix form. Uh, you get an equation for the eigenvalue problem which contains the boundary <laughs> element. And then the trick is how to, um, how to write the, the values of the polynomials at the boundaries, which are, let's say, if you're imposing Neumann conditions, they are largely unknown. If they're Dirichlet, then you can just set them to zero, and these two just vanish. And so you just solve for the, for the eigenvalue problem in the interior, and basically the Dirichlet conditions tell you how the wave function behaves on the boundaries. But if they're Neumann type, then you have to determine the um, the wave functions at the boundaries using information from the interior. So once, so you have to, you work with these, um, you have to construct these boundary matrices mm -hmm. such that the derivatives vanish at the, at the boundaries. And then you have to add those equations back in. When you do that, you're able to write out a, a simpler sort of eigenvalue problem for the interior. So this is a Chebyshev uh, pseudospectral method of order four, so you only see four, uh, of order three, so you only see four points. You get n plus one points. So this is just for an example. However, in the real case, uh, you can have many more uh, points, up to about 40 or 50 or 60 points for the polynomials. So before I jump into uh, the actual Hartree-Fock equation, how to solve it in a, using the pseudospectral methods, just as a quick refresher, um, uh, this is what I've written here is the Hartree-Fock equation. Uh, what we see is, if you don't have the stuff in the middle, it just looks like the hyd uh, hydrogenic problem where you have the, a discretized representation of the Hamiltonian and the wave function, and, and then the, the eigenvalue problem itself. Whereas in the Hartree-Fock case, it's a coupled problem where the, the eigenvalues, uh, where the wave function for the ith state also depends upon the wave function of the jth state, and that appears as a coupling in the, uh, the Hartree-Fock equation. Um, the first term is called the direct coupling, which occurs for between the, um, the ith and the jth wave functions. Both these are spin dependent. This, is, this does not vanish in the case where the spins are um, parallel or perpendicular, whereas the exchange, which is a purely spin dependent term, it is only non-zero when the spins of the electrons are perfectly aligned. If they're anti-aligned, then the exchange term vanishes. So in the anti-aligned case, namely the partially spin-polarized configurations, it's easier to solve the Hartree-Fock equations. So much of the work from Schmelker and the other people that I showed before, they only looked at the partially spin-polarized configurations because you don't have this added complication and it's easier to solve it. But as soon as you add this in, it severely, it, it, includes, it includes a greater amount of severity in the calculations. So you have to work harder to get it. Um, so the exchange term, particularly when all the electrons are anti-aligned, so all their spins are parallel to each other, so every electron has an exchange with every other electron. So the, comp the computation becomes really expensive. Um, this is at the level of Hartree-Fock, uh, meaning that I have not considered uh, well, I've only written down one configuration, one slated determinant, and I'm not considering what happens if you have mixing between various other configurations, which is a way of getting at correlation between the electrons. What that is is if, if you have an electron which has a probability of being in this neighborhood, 
other electrons don't want to be there. They want to be elsewhere. So there is a correlation between the wave functions. That is included by having uh, various different slater determinants, which I have not shown in this Hartree-Fock equation. But you can write down um, a Hartree-Fock equation with a greater number of configurations, and then this will become more messy. Um, so I'm, at the moment, I'm working at the Hartree-Fock level. So once you've discretized it, you end up with a, a rather messy looking matrix where you have to impose boundary conditions along certain rows and certain columns. And it's, uh, it's a bit tricky to do the bookkeeping. Um, but once you're able to do that, you can impose boundary conditions for each of the two electrons along certain rows and certain columns. And then you arrive at this eigenvalue problem that you can solve. And in my case, I solve it um, using a standard um, package, the Arnoldi package, which is very good for getting at a small spectrum of, um, of an eigenvalue problem. Um, we don't really want the entire spectrum. We just want a handful of states, which are the most bound uh, states. So over here are results uh, from, from, the various, um, from the various simulations that I carried out. Um, so here you're looking at helium, and this is the, uh, so as I said, this is the spectroscopic notation which you may be used to, whereas this, this you can only use the spectroscopic notation when there are no fields present. When you turn on the field, particularly as the field becomes higher and higher, um, the only good quantum number are the azimuthal ones, so you, you still get um, well, this, this number here is the sum of the two azimuthal quantum numbers of the, of the electrons. Uh, the three over here is the multiplicity, the spin multiplicity, which is 2s plus 1. And this is the excitation level, meaning it's the ground state of this configuration. And this plus represents parity with respect to the, to the z-axis. So the key thing to, uh, to take away from this is that as the field strength increases, all the atomic configurations, they undergo a, a similar phenomenon where they just simply shrink and they become more and more tightly bound. So the binding energies, they skyrocket in this case. So at beta z of about 1,000, which is 10 to the 12 Gauss, um, the binding energy is, of, of, if we just took hydrogen, for example, the, uh, without a field, it's about 13.6 electron volts. When you go to about a th uh, 10 to the 12 Gauss, the ground state energy skyrockets to about 160, 170 electron volts. So it's incredibly bound. And this is uh, various configurations, excited states of helium. And uniformly, they become more and more bound. So the key challenge here, as you see that as the geometry becomes more and more extreme, one has to maintain, um, one has to be able to resolve the wave function at these small scales and still be able to determine um, the, how the interaction between the electrons vanishes at infinities. So you have to maintain accuracy of your method, your numerical method, at both these small scales close to the nucleus as well as at the infinities. So, Pseudo-spectral methods actually is really helpful there because um, the property of uh, a Chebyshev polynomial is that it, is, um, it bunches up the points. It's only located between minus 1 and 1. So if you map any domain conformally to minus 1 and 1, and then you distribute uh, Chebyshev Lovato points there, you find that they are bunched up towards 0 as well as towards infinity. So you get uh, accuracy both in those regions close to the nucleus as well as far away from the nucleus. So that's a key advantage of pseudospectral methods for atomic structure. So I gather that this is yep. sort of a, a test case um, helium. So how, how do your results agree with other methods? They, are, they agree quite, uh, quite completely at the less than 1% level. Okay. And so I'd say that the electron correlations are, aren't important at more than the 1% level over So from about 10 to the 9 to about 10 to the 12 Gauss. And yep. the quantum Monte Carlo methods, they include? They include correlation, yeah. They include correlation. Um, but they have a weakness that they're very good for the ground states. 
but as the states become more excited, a bit like in density functional theory, for excited states, the accuracy diminishes very rapidly because the exchange correlation is not very well um, determined. So when you say that the for example, yep. that's, that's for the ground state. For, uh, for in my case, I find that Yes, for the ground state, it is better than 1 part in 10 to the 5. And for the higher excited states, it diminishes to 1 part in 10 to the 4. Yep, over that field, over that range. That's the worst accuracy I'm getting. Um, I've also been able to use my code for uh, looking at um, low Z atoms, um, in particular uh, carbon, where basically only two of all these states uh, were known. Um, and so I've been able to get, get a data for a few more states, and uh, I'm hoping that this sort of data will be useful uh, for getting at transition wavelengths. What is the subscript minus 3 minus 4 minus 5 Yeah, so if you look at the 2p orbital, you'd have 2px, 2py, and 2pz. So you can order them according to minus l, so the azimuthal quantum number. So L could be minus 1, 0, or 1. So the 2p orbital would have a minus 1 shell, a 0 shell, or a plus 1 shell. A d would have a minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, and 2, and so on. So again, this is just, um, if you were to take this, um, this state and gradually turn down the field, and did not allow the electrons to undergo a spin flip, they would get stuck in this state. That's the way to read this. So the way to really read it, uh, the way to understand what happens in the st strong field case is that it's in some weird um, configuration. <laughs> the orbitals do not correspond to this geometry at all. The symmetries just change. Yeah. Um, anyway, so um, for these states, which have been determined for helium, um, for some of them, uh, particularly for the excited ones, like um, in this case, I think minus two, uh, it, I've, I was able to get more accurate results than the quantum Monte Carlo with, uh, with the pseudospectral code. Um, the, t the calculation times were also small, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, as I said before, the, um, the, the key here for me was to get uh, a code which is compact enough and also quick enough that if spectral modelers, if they want to use it, for them it's not a big computational overhead. So um, the code that I've constructed, it, it's, uh, it's in, it runs on shared memory, and it uses number of cores depending on how many electrons we have. So for helium, it runs on two cores. For lithium, it runs on three cores, etc. But the computational times are on the order of seconds. So for helium, for getting one part in 10 to the 4 accuracy, it takes about 10 seconds. Um, for lithium, it takes about 20 seconds. So the scaling with the number of electrons is almost linear. Whereas um, the computational time increases um, with, um, with, the, with the number of uh, points for mesh refinement as order n cubed. So these are roughly cubic. So uh, it, it goes as the cube of capital N, and it goes as linearly with the number of electrons. And uh, the times are small, largely because of spectral accuracy, uh, which is that as you increase the number of mesh points, the errors diminish in an exponential fashion. So you converge onto the solution really quickly. So this behavior is exponential. It's not quadratic, where you have a slow rise and it uh, asymptotes off. Um, there was another artifact which, uh, which I found. Is, um, it was a bit more, it, was a, it wasn't very straightforward at first, but um, when you have a, when you have a, a, a square domain, um, and in, in the case of the atom, like I mentioned, it's a semi-infinite domain, where you're going from zero all the way to infinity in either direction. Um, if you conformally map it to minus one to plus one, and then impose boundary conditions in this conformally mapped domain, it turns out that it doesn't resolve a strip 
around the, the infinities all that well, even though the Lobato points exist almost all the way up there. So what I did instead was just something a bit more simple than conformally mapping a semi-infinite domain. Um, one, could just con one could just imagine you have a, the atom exists in a, in a sufficiently large domain, not semi-infinite, but let's say it goes from zero to 100 Bohr radii in each direction. And then you map that domain conformally to minus one and one. And then you can put chebyshev lobato points there. So when you do that, you can, um, you can construct various domains of different sizes. And then it, in each domain size, you carry out a set of calculations with mesh refinement. So it turns out that when you do that, um, the convergence with regard to mesh refinement is exponential in each case. However, with regard to the domain size, the convergence is quadratic. So the method overall is, is better than, slightly better than quadratic convergence. When you get to, um, when you try and get at the converged um, uh, result for the energies. Yeah. I didn't yep. quite get when you were explaining the effective factor method. So yep. I can understand that when you're doing the hydrogen atom, you're dealing with a two-dimensional configuration space. Uh, but with helium, I would expect it's a four-dimensional configuration space. Mm -hmm. um, so, so are you, in each case, reducing it down through our three thought to a two-dimensional space? So the wave functions are two-dimensional. Each wave function for every electron, for each electron. is two-dimensional. But the, the problem is when you have two electrons, each of those electrons is coupled. So there's an extra coupling there. So that, I think, is what you're referring to as dimensionality. Right. right? So that increases as you add atoms. And so the matrix becomes bigger and bigger. So for a okay, so the configuration space translates into, into the matrix, matrix space, space. yeah. But the exactly. So for the hydrogen atom, you have something this big. Whereas for helium, it would be four times that, and then so on. Okay. Yep. So the current efforts I've, I have ongoing are trying to do, um, trying to get at the energy levels of silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, um, and also try and get transition data and oscillator strengths for all these different um, atoms. And I'm also trying to uh, develop a, a multi-configuration version of this code, and. I'm toying around with adding crossed E and B fields to see if, um, if we could get at some of the, see what happens to the atom when we do this. So those are the directions in which I'm currently pursuing work. Um, thank you. Let's, uh, maybe I can go back to. So, so, oh, <laughs> okay. So um, if your Zeeman um, perturbation analysis, if, let's say, you're at a field strength of somewhere around 10 to the 8 Gauss or so, um, the accuracy here, um, this is from a Hartree-Fock code. The accuracy here is you know, 1 part in 10 to the 4. So the accuracy of this line, where it sits here, is, is very well constrained. Um, this is, that means the transition between, they know the energy levels for this transition really well. So they know the wavelength really well as well. Whereas if you don't know those energy levels, if you only know those energy levels to 20% accuracy, which is completely possible, if you only do a perturbation analysis at these field strengths, so then 
you don't know where this line is going to be. It could be f much further away. So it would then be, then you wouldn't know what this, whether this feature is well, because I of that or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, ten to the seven-ish Gauss. Molecular chains. That's what Kuhn and Langaker, et cetera, they did. They, when they did their calculations, they were, I think, one part in 10 to the 3 or so. Um, these days, for the ground states of the chains using density functional theory uh, with really nice exchange correlation wave functions, well designed ones, they're able to go down, right down to one part in 10 to the 5. So the accuracy is very high. The trouble really comes from the fact that. The electrons, they're all spin flipped. So that really messes up the correlation. So the computational overhead just goes skyrocketing. Yeah. More questions? If not, uh, let's thank you again. Thank you.